without further ado, le let me introduce you with our speaker today, Erin Barbato. Erin is the director of the Immigrant Justice Clinic at the UW Medicine Law School. She teaches second and third year law students to represent individuals in removal proceedings and with humanitarian based immigration relief. The work often in involves representing people seeking refuge in the United States. Previously, Erin worked as an immigration, in immigration attorney at a nonprofit or organization and in private, private practice. Prior to law school, Erin volunteered as a teacher at El Centro del Muchejo. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and uh, which, which is a non profit organization in Quito, Ecuador, where she worked with uh, resettled refugee families living at or below the poverty line. With this, uh, I'm now going to turn it to Ed Erin, who will introduce us to the film Flee, uh, a mo movie based on a true story of an Afghan refugee. Um, Erin, over to you. You have uh, roughly about 35 to 40 minutes from now. Great. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here today to talk about this. I um, was so grateful for the opportunity to see this movie. It really struck me in a number of ways. And I'm hoping to share a little bit about um, U.S. asylum and refugee law and what it looks like today and how it relates to this um, moving, incredible story. So I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully I can do that since I've been doing this for a long time. Now, let's see. All right, everyone can see this, I assume. Good, okay, thanks for the thumbs up. That's helpful <laughs> for the visual. So today I hope to talk a little bit about um, the Afghan refugee experience in Wisconsin and beyond and how it relates to the movie. Because at the time that the movie, um, the story was reflecting, it was a different experience than the Afghan experience that we have recently seen in the past six months in the US. Um, but the themes hold true throughout um, for the refugee experience. So I work at the Immigrant Justice Clinic at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Um, it's a clinical program. So I teach students who are second and third year law students to represent people in immigration proceedings. Oftentimes this means we're going to immigration court where someone is fighting for their um, right to remain here in the United States um, through a process called asylum. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, but over the past few years, we also have done a number of experiential learning trips where it takes us to the southern border or to Mexico, um, most recently to Fort McCoy, where there were 12, about 12,000 um, Afghans temporarily housed. And this summer, we are actually planning to take a few students to, um, to Germany and possibly Poland to work with Afghan and um, now Ukrainian refugees. So. Uh, I will continue. So first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much for everyone for being here. Um, I'll go over a brief overview of the US refugee and asylum sy um, system and then give a historical um, or a, a review of what we recently saw over the past seven months um, in the United States. And then I'll also mention Title 42, which is affecting asylum in the United States quite substantially. And then we should have some time for questions because I'm sure um, I'm hoping to be here to answer a lot of the questions that people have today about the movie and about current um, refugee and asylum issues in the United States. Uh, right now, the International Rescue Committee, which is an international um, NGO that was actually housed at um, Fort McCoy, they have a, a list of their 20, um, 22 emergency watch list, which shows us the countries that they deem to be um, where there's most, uh, uh, um, pressing humanitarian issues. And so you can look at what number one right now is Afghanistan, but what you don't see on here is Ukraine because they didn't even have that um, when this was issued. So this is mostly just to say that these, we can't always anticipate where humans will need 
to seek refuge, um, but also to highlight that there are a number of places in the world that we're not even talking about today where people um, are in need of refuge or um, humanitarian need. So just the real basics. So immigrating to the United States, this is taking it a, a real step, a kind of a step back, but in order to come to the United States, someone has to have a manner in order to come to the United States. And so it's very confusing a lot of times when people say, just get in, why don't people just get in line? Why don't they just get in line to come to the United States? Or why don't they just go through the asylum process? None of these, none of the, there is no process that is easy and you have to fit into a very specific category to even come to the United States. So that might be through a family, through employment, um, what we'll talk about today is mostly humanitarian reasons. Uh, we do have a diversity lottery. We wouldn't be the United States if there wasn't a way to play a game to win your way to, to come to the United States. Um, and then there's also ways people can come here for what's called non-immigrant reasons, for a temporary amount of time through tourism. Um, many, some of you maybe as students or, um, or even for temporary business issues. Um, but I'm going to focus today on this humanitarian based immigration that are within the laws of the United States and many other laws in other countries. So as we saw um, in the movie, Denmark was one of the countries that was highlighted as well as Sweden. And they have um, similar protections for refugees and asylees, but are still um, but different than the United States. Uh, but in the United States, when we look at humanitarian based immigration, I focus on what we deem a refugee. And we'll talk about that in, in the comparison of a refugee and the asylum process, an asylee. There's something called temporary protective status, which some of you may have recently heard about relating to people from Afghanistan as well as Ukraine. Um, port parole, which is the way that most of the 80,000 Afghans that recently arrived in the United States were permitted to enter something called humanitarian parole. And there's something called a U visa, which is for survivors of serious crimes. And then the special immigrant visa, which um, is usually for unaccompanied minors or children that are um, abused, abandoned, or neglected. And it's a way for them to uh, remain here in the United States. It, um, this pathway to citizenship, the special immigrant, um, well, the special immigrant visa that, that's on here is um, specifically for Afghans, but there's also one for children, which I just mentioned. And it really made me, um, came to mind when I was watching, uh, I mean, when he entered um, and had to say that his family was all, he was alone. And there are certain ways, certain protections for children without other protections in the world in different countries, including Denmark. So what is a refugee? I mean, we heard this, this word throughout the movie. We hear it on the news um, on a daily basis, or at least I do. But the 1951 Refugee Convention defined um, a refugee. And this was when the world, you know, very broad strokes, came together to uh, try to ensure that something like World War II would never happen again, where countries sent people back to places where they would be harmed and even um, lose their lives. So a refugee, the definition is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or their political opinion. And so when we think of Amin in the, um, in the movie, he may have had a few reasons why he would qualify under this definition of a refugee. One being um, sexual orientation, one possibly being his you know, political opinion. Um, but we hear the word refugee and asylee. And so what's the difference? And you may think, what is this photograph of these um, wonderful uh, uh, stick figures that someone drew. And no, I do, do them myself, not my children. It's a really not very talented artist, but it's a way to explain to everybody something that is important to understand in this world of um, humanitarian law. So refugees generally are gonna be outside of the United States. In order to become a refugee and process to be resettled in the United States, the United Nations has to find you to be a refugee. So oftentimes we see those in, um, 
what we call, you know, refugee camps in um, different countries, Jordan, um, in uh, different countries in Africa. But you can't, uh, you need to have that refugee status before the United States will say, we can allow you to come to the United States. So that's by the, the UN has to find someone to be a refugee. These other stick figures that we have, one kind of near Chicago and the other on our southern border, those indicate places where people could seek asylum in the United States. And refugee and asylum, the asylee, the definitions are the same. You have to prove the same thing, that you um, are, have a fear of persecution based on one of the five enumerated grounds. But where your location is will determine how you process. Um, if you want to come to the United States and seek asylum, the only way you can do that is either knocking at a port of entry, and most of the time that's going to happen on our southern border, which is currently closed to asylum seekers, or after you've entered the United States um, in a different manner, possibly without inspection, but oftentimes um, maybe after entering on a, a visitor visa or something uh, similar. But there are very limited ways for people to seek these protections either a complicated way through the UN after fleeing and living for years in a refugee camp or coming to the United States and facing often what will be years long in a, a legal system and often um, living in, in detention. So the president of the United States along with a consultation with Congress decides how many refugees so people that are determined to be refugees by the United Nations outside of the United States, and how many people can come to the United States every year. The United States has a long history of admitting um, more refugees than any other country. But as you can see from the first year after um, this law went into effect in 1980, our numbers have gone down, gone down substantially, especially in the past four years um, or five years. The Trump administration, um, President Trump, he decreased the number of refugees substantially. Um, and that blue line is the number that the, um, the president decides can enter the United States. And then the orange line indicates how many people actually enter. So you can see um, around 9-11, that number dropped substantially because we basically closed our borders. But over the past few years, they've gone down substantially due to um, the president. But o Biden, I always call him O Biden because I confuse President Obama with Biden. I apologize, second time I've done that this week. But um, Biden has increased the number of refugees that we will be admitting um, this year to 125,000, which is even larger than the number um, in Obama's last uh, year of presidency, where it was 85,000. So again, an asylee is the same um, definition as refugee, but situationally, locationally different. Um, and an example of an asylee, uh, including someone who would be applying for asylum based on this particular social group, it could be a man who is gay, who's fleeing Afghanistan as the Taliban are known to persecute and torture people who are gay. So that would be um, a way that if Amin was coming to the United States today, would and he somehow got here either through a visa or somehow traveling to our Southern border, he would maybe um, be eligible for asylum, but it would be a very long um, legal process for him. There were a few uh, quotes from the movie that really stuck out to me that I think are important to pause and talk about today because we use, um, you know, I de define what an asylee or a refugee is based on these laws and, um, but it's, you know, it's so much more. And I thought some of his words were really striking, especially um, when he said that being a refugee is not an identity, but it's a circumstance of life. Um, and I think that's an important thing to remember um, on a daily basis as we're, we are all learning more about the refugee um, crisis in our world today. Um, he also said, I wanted to tell a story also to the entire world that there is more into this concept of being a refugee. There are human beings behind the concept and they are not much different than anybody else. So seeking refuge, I think we all, um, by watching this movie, we witnessed a lot of the dangers that are involved when someone has to flee their country, um, not by choice, but by circumstance. And I, while I was watching the movie, I kind of wrote down notes of 
things that from Amin's journey that I see on a daily basis for people that I'm working with from um, Central America, um, Venezuela, um, from Cameroon, a lot of, you know, these themes, these terrifying journeys that they've gone on, the people that prey on them um, are common throughout. So we saw family separation. I mean, that we've seen that happen at our borders, uh, forcibly done by our government over the past, well, in the past and not happening as often now, but still happening. Human traffickers, um, one of the largest uh, illegal industries in the world, people making money off of trafficking people, including children, um, this lack of freedom movement. So um, I was trying to map, I mean, journey. How did he get to Denmark? And what you may have witnessed or, or noticed or may have not noticed is that the reason that they first fled to Russia was the only, because it was the only country that people from Afghanistan could obtain what's called a visitor status there. So they could actually enter. So a lot of people are forced to cross borders without authorization. Um, but a lot of times people don't have an option because they can't get a visa. So when we look at someone from Central America who's trying to seek asylum up into the, in the United States, they generally don't have an option of applying for a visitor visa to just come to the United States because they don't qualify for one. It's incredibly difficult to obtain a non-immigrant visa to come to the United States if you are not wealthy and you don't have um, a lot of ties to your home country. Um, we see these restrictive immigration laws. And one thing that I thought that the movie did beautifully, um, well, so much of it was incredible, but explaining why some people who are fleeing for their lives don't have the option of telling the truth at all times. Um, it was very clear to me that he knew if he told, if he didn't tell the truth when he um, arrived in Denmark, if he did tell the truth when he arrived in Denmark, he would have been deported. And that was not an option for him. So he had to explain that his family was no longer alive, even though they were, because of the circumstance was life and death. And I often think we forget about that. Um, and by we, I mean, I don't know, the general public sometimes. Um, but even with me, I'm like, why did, why did this little boy tell this officer something that wasn't necessarily the truth? Because of fear, because of circumstance, because they don't have any other choice. Um, unaccompanied minors, you know, I mean, was what he's traveling on his own. There's a lot of children um, in this world who are forced to seek um, refuge on their own without the protection of, um, of really anybody. And I also thought that the, um, was struck by how the uh, movie illustrated corrupt law enforcement as well. Um, you know, why don't you seek, you know, I often say like, why don't you seek protection of the police in your own country? Or why don't you seek um, protection of the border patrol um, guards? It's because a lot of them um, are not safe people. Um, and I think in the United States, while we all know that law enforcement is not safe for everybody, there is um, different themes of trust and um, accountability that are not always available to people seeking refuge. Okay. So now I'll move on to talk a little bit about um, my experience and what I've witnessed with uh, people from Afghanistan seeking, um, who were evacuated. So when we talked about you know, these two uh, asylee versus refugee, those are kind of the normal ways for someone to seek refuge in the United States, both incredibly difficult, but those are kind of the standard ways. But the evacuation from Afghanistan in August of um, 2021 was historic for a number of reasons, but it also was a way that the United States opened its doors to people who did not yet have refugee status um, and did not have asylee status either. They were paroled into the United States for humanitarian reasons, which is under the discretion of our government. Um, Most of them were brought to the United States and were living on US military installations. When, um, on about August 25th, I was actually um, at Fort Bliss in El Paso, which is on closer, much closer to our Southern border. And you can see a picture here of um, 
a military base that was also used for housing um, Afghan uh, people from Afghanistan. But when I was there, these are the tents that um, housed children who um, unaccompanied minors seeking refuge in the United States. And so I was down there working with them and I was in my hotel room one morning getting ready to leave. And then I saw this announcement that um, Afghans would be arriving at Fort McCoy. And in my head, I was, that sounds really familiar, but, and then it was in Wisconsin. So when I got back here, um, that's you know where some of our work ended up taking place. Um, but they're at Fort Bliss where they were housing um, thousands of unaccompanied minors. They also started housing um, people from Afghanistan. So the US government evacuated over 130,000 people from Afghanistan in August of 2021. Not all of them came to the United States. Um, many of them did stay in Spain, Italy, and Germany. But uh, about 80,000 were brought to the United States and were um, housed temporarily, but longer than they had anticipated on these military inst installations that were run by the US military, which I always think is a surprising um, humanitarian uh, leader. But many of the people that signed up um, the military, they had signed up for humanitarian work. So, these are a few pictures at Fort McCoy, which is about two hours north of Madison. Um, the Afghans and their families, they fled and were brought, um, first were uh, screened in, uh, in Qatar or in um, Germany uh, for vaccinations and um, they did a biometric screening. So for criminal records and such. Um, Following the security screening, they were then brought and separated into these eight military installations called safe havens. Um, at the safe havens, when they arrived, many of them thought they would only be there for a few weeks, but it ended up many of them being there for six or seven months. The um, US wasn't quite ready to uh, help resettle this many 80,000 people because during the Trump administration, as you saw in that chart before, the number of refugees that we admitted had gone down so substantially that most of the organizations closed their doors that had done this work previously. So when 80,000 people arrived in kind of a unanticipated manner, we weren't quite ready. Um, and so people started opening their doors and getting the funding they needed. And, but at the time they arrived, um, we, were, we were behind. Uh, so the government did medical screening, biometric data and additional interviews at, of the Afghans at these bases while they waited to be resettled into communities here in the United States. Um, Fort McCoy hosted approximately uh, 12,000 12, Afghan nationals. Uh, at the start, when I first started volunteering there, there were a lot of complaints. Um, it wasn't really complaints because people were so grateful to be in a safe location, but they didn't have enough clothing. Some of them had shoes that didn't fit them. They waited in line for hours to get food um, and really didn't know what the next steps were because we were all trying to get our ducks in a row. Um, and it took a lot longer than I think most people had hoped. Um, but after a few months, things started getting more clear. But you can see here, uh, these are the, the, the homes. They're kind of like barracks that the um, Afghans lived in. Um, single men and single women were separated and then family units were allowed to live together, but they were still in these um, kind of community spaces and that would often just be divided by a sheet or some kind of divider. Um, and mind you, this was is still during a global pandemic. So it wasn't, um, people were anxious to leave. They were anxious to get to their you know, relatives, their families to start their new lives in the United States. Um, and it took a lot longer than um, people really anticipated. But you can see here, um, once people were able to leave these military installations, um, they were uh, then resettled in communities where they are now building their, their lives. Um, you can see that Texas, California, and New York, I believe are the three states that um, resettled the most Afghan people from Afghanistan. 
you can see here in Wisconsin, um, these are, are, I think I'm hoping, I think these are our current numbers, but um, not a huge number of people, but we are a small state and we don't have a ton of resettlement agencies or a large Afghan population. And people, most of the people, if not every person I talked to at Fort McCoy wanted to go to Sacramento or to Virginia because there are larger um, communities there for them to live with or they had family there. And the resettlement agencies were, were um, over, uh, were, did not have capacity to take additional people, but you can see there's people in Milwaukee, Fox Valley, um, Brown County, Wausau, and um, right here in Dane County, who are working with um, these refugee resettlement agencies. So Catholic Charities, International Institute of Wisconsin, Jewish Social Services, they're actually running the resettlement here in Madison, for those of you who are here, um, and then a few other organizations um, that are now working with people to be resettled and also some of them are helping them with on their legal journey. So I mentioned this before, um, because they didn't arrive specifically with as refugees or start the asylum process, they had to go on, um, seek additional legal, uh, a different legal process. So many were um, paroled into the United States, which is a temporary process. It gives them two years to be in the United States. Many of you probably heard about the special immigrant visa, which is specifically for Afghans who um, assisted the US military or um, other government uh, in Afghanistan. And we had promised people who did that a pathway to citizenship and a way out of Afghanistan quickly. That didn't really happen. There's also something called the P1, P2 for people who worked for, um, uh, mostly for media and um, so NPR, Axos, um, and then humanitarian parole was another way people could come to the United States. But the only pathway to citizenship here is if someone arrived in special immigrant with a special immigrant visa. And the special immigrant visa was created in um, 2009 by Congress, and it was designated for Afghan interpreters, translators, and individuals who work directly with the US government. It has been plagued for years um, with delays. And uh, one of the reasons why so many people needed to be evacuated in this emergency situation, because they didn't yet have their visa and a way to leave. In order to qualify, you had to have worked for the US government. Um, and then you must have demonstrated that you face or continue to face a serious threat because of one's employment with the US government. If someone was able to obtain this SIV, the special immigrant visa, they could come to the United States and immediately have this permanent status that was a pathway to citizenship. Um, but sadly it didn't, because of the processing delays, a lot of the promises we made um, were not fulfilled. It's a 14 step application process. There is, when we wanna say extreme vetting, this is extreme vetting. Um, about 75,000 people did qualify for SIB and did obtain them, but as of, um, October of this year, there's still about 30,000 pending and there's an additional people in the United States that do qualify, but there's not really a way for them to obtain it now that they're here. So um, they were admitted in this court parole, which is not a pathway to citizenship. Um, it only gives them two years to be here in the United States and then they have to find a different way to, um, to immigrate. One thing I did wanna mention, um, was that the use of pork parole and US military uh, installations in the past is not new. These are a few pictures actually from uh, Fort McCoy in 1980 when Fort McCoy housed about 14,000 Cubans who left on the Muriel Gold Lift. Um, and you can see in these pictures, I don't know if you can see as well as I, but the housing, the barracks are exactly the same. Um, how many years later, 30 years later, 40 years later. So 40 years later, yeah. Um, so when we look at the future for ways for Afghans to remain in the United States, some of them may have a pathway to citizenship through family. So if they have a US citizen um, parent or uh, that might be a way that they can come to the United States. Employment, if they have a high level of education or very specialized skill, there might be a way for them to seek permanent status here in the United States to that, but the majority of them will be going through the asylum process. They will need to apply for asylum in the United States, which normally takes years and is a very um, 
difficult process. You uh, need to demonstrate with evidence that you will be persecuted based on one of the enumerated grounds if you are um, forced to return to your home country. Um, the U.S. government has announced an expedited process for people from Afghanistan, but it will still not be easy. Um, in the U.S. immigration system, you are not um, afforded the right. You can have an attorney, but only if you can afford one, and um, or you can find a pro bono attorney, and there simply aren't enough. Uh, there's also temporary permission for people to remain. One is they may be able to renew their parole status. Uh, after the two years have expired. And then Biden um, recently announced temporary protected status, which would allow people who are here in the United States um, from Afghanistan as of March 15th to apply for an 18 month protection from being deported. Uh, and many people may wanna do that, but it's not a pathway to citizenship, it's just temporary. So what is next for the Afghans? Um, a lot remains unknown. Some of us still hope for Congress to act and create what I would call an Afghan Adjustment Act, which would automatically give people a pathway to citizenship here in the United States if they were evacuated. Um, but people are continuing to resettle in their communities looking for support. Um, and many will seek asylum and many need will need pro bono attorneys. Um, at the beginning, Chakra, you did mention, you know, Ukraine and what is, I think is on many people's minds. Um, we, uh, President Biden did announce this temporary protected status for 18 months for people from Ukraine. Um, if they were here uh, on a certain date, uh, they may be able to apply for protection here in the United States for 18 months until hopefully things get better. Um, Ukraine is an interesting, I mean, it's horrific what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and I think it's opening people's eyes to some of the horrors around the world. Um, people from Ukraine at this point may not qualify as asylees. Um, it, it's gonna depend on uh, what happens in their country, but the temporary protected status is a way for the president to allow people to stay here while there is, um, Generally, it's a natural disaster or a war or some other um, danger that is deemed temporary. And so we will see how long, how long this lasts. Um, one thing I did want to mention, and then I will stop talking, and then hopefully people can answer questions or have questions. But I did didn't want to not speak about the status of um, our southern border and an asylum process here in the United States today. Our southern border remains closed under Title 42, which is for um, a way that the president can um, close the border for a uh, protection um, based on an uh, emergency health issue. And um, it started over two years ago and it remains today, even as the country is opening up from the pandemic and mask mandates are going away and vaccinations are on the rise. They, um, we are still closing our border to people who are seeking refuge. There are a few exceptions, um, one being unaccompanied minors, like I talked about the, the kiddos in um, El Paso. And um, there are other exceptions. And it, it appears that if someone from the Ukraine is arriving on our southern border, they are being processed um, into the United States, while our neighbors from, from Mexico, Haiti, um, remain blocked from seeking the protections that we generally allow under our under our laws. So I don't want to forget to mention that because it's it's important. Um, this is my contact information. Um, if anybody uh, has questions in the future, but we have we have time for questions now as well. So I will stop sharing my screen, and then hopefully we can continue a discussion. Um, first of all, uh, this is a brilliant sum, sum, summing up the, the key elements of this movie. And I, I really th thank you, Irene. Um, and also you offered us some insights into the US immigration policies and practices. And I'm, I'm sure they are very use, useful to, to our, our viewers to, to do today. 
um, fr Frank, actually, when I watched this uh, movie, movie, movie at f first, uh, uh, it resonated me at so many levels that I could really relate. Uh, I'm now going to open up the discussion and I would like to invite our viewers to post their questions and comments in the chat, chat box. Um, but while, while, while we wait for the questions, uh, Erin, let me ask this. Uh, we have watched this uh, in the movie, movie that uh, I think it's just an example of how refugees often are forced to live in the shadow. As you as you also mentioned that they don't have, uh, they, they are being exploited and robbed by the systems and the institutions. Mm -hmm. So they often do not have access to some of the basic economic and social rights such as education, livelihoods, healthcare, and social security. And, and I, I would like to add this, that you know that a lot of the countries that are not party to the Refugee Con Convention 51, mm -hmm. they do not even acknowledge these rights, let alone implement, implementing them. Uh, example is the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh is not a party to the convention and they do not even mention that they are refugees. They say the, the, these people are the forcibly displaced Myanmar and national. I mean, they coined this term, FDMN. Mm -hmm. And they enjoy nearly none of these basic economic social rights, including education, livelihoods, health, health, health care. So this creates uh, somewhat a very dangerous, explosive situation. A generation of the refugee children are now growing up with, without education. We don't know because what will happen to them, that's a perfect recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. Isn't it part of the customary international law that these rights are respected? I'm, I'm just asking, I, I would like to know because when uh, we work, I, I work for Amnesty International, and we advocated for their rights, but we had a hard time to convince the officials in the Bangladeshi regime that you have to allow these kids to go to school. And I think international at the international governance level, except the principle of non-reformment, I'm, I'm not sure how these uh, other basic rights are enforceable and what we, we can do. I, and yeah, that's a really interesting question. And um, I think highlights, you know, discrepancies around the world and how different populations are treated with more respect and more opportunity, um, mostly based on circumstance, not, not much else. Or, I mean, it could be a lot more nefarious um, issues as well. But when we look at the United States and when someone arrives and, you know, they have been deemed a refugee by the United Nations and we um, then have room for them and they come to the United States and are official refugee. They have one year um, in refugee status and then they can apply for their lawful permanent resident and have a pathway to citizenship. Many of them, um, they should be paired with a resettlement agency that informs them of their rights and also um, helps them, you know, resettle in the community, including going to school. I mean, I, our clinic worked with um, International Rescue Committee and to providing Afghans with just some like, know your rights information. Like your children have the right to go to school, but your children actually like legally have to go to school too in the United States. So, um, but some of these communities they're gonna be welcomed in and some, some they aren't. Um, but that's obviously not the situation around the world, especially if someone arrives and they're not officially refuge, uh, deemed refugees by the UN, but they are refugees in the global sense of what the word is. And, but they have to live in the shadows because they fear that they could be forcibly removed from that country. And so, and different countries have different resources. And so, you know, you can sometimes understand why someone would say, you know, I've had clients who had fled to the United States and said, I studied what you know, what the U.S. can offer through their asylum laws and, you know, through the refugee process, while others, they can't, and they're stuck um, in these situations that are uninhabitable and inhumane. Um, and especially thinking about the children, that's... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat box. Uh, Christine, 
um, asked you, would you please explain how you interact with refugees, asylees? How do you connect with individuals? What services can you provide them? And have you worked with people for years as they navigate this legal, legal process? Uh, yes. And then I'll, I'll go back to the, the, the other question, but please. Sure. Yeah, so I've been, um, I am old. I've been doing this work for about 20 years. Um, and, but through the clinic at the law school, which, um, really is quite amazing what the law school supports and what the students bring to people um, in these emergent situations. So we are, sometimes we do these exper experiential learning trips where we provide limited information to people who are in detention on the southern border, women and children, people who are stuck in Mexico on one of the um, exclusionary uh, policies uh, being something called migrant protection protocols or this title 42, but also, you know, at Fort McCoy, it was mostly providing information of you entered in for parole, eventually you're gonna to need to apply for asylum. So it can be in that limited sense of really pr providing know your rights, or we do provide direct representation to people who are facing um, removal from the United States. Um, great. And I think you're you are really do, doing great service to the community. Uh, Mitra asked, um, uh, could you say more about whether and to what extent Afghan evacuees are allowed to work while in the US? So most of the um, Afghans who processed through this evacuation and on the military bases, one of the first things that US Citizenship and Immigration Services did through the Department of Homeland Security is, um, they sent people actually to the bases to help them apply for their work permits, which they're eligible to have for two years under this port parole. So once they have their um, actual, it's called an employment authorization document, they can work legally in the United States for um, up to two years and possibly renew that after. But if someone has um, applies for asylum, then asylum will allow them to work in the United States as well. So that's something different. When you arrive um, seeking asylum, not through this court parole process, you don't have the right to work right away. So that can be very difficult for these families and these individuals. Do they have the freedom of movement and move with this uh, EAD um, and work elsewhere? They can't, yeah, so the freedom of movement is, within the United States, they are free to move. But if they leave their resettlement agency before, um, they have to go to this, the city where they are matched with a resettlement agency. Otherwise they may lose their eligibility for yes. those benefits. So it's, there's freedom of movement, but there's limitations. Within the, right, mm -hmm. within the community. Um, AC asked us, uh, what can be done about human trafficking? That was one of the big shocking elements of the movie. And can anything be done to reduce, re reduce such dangerous human tra trafficking? Human trafficking, um, yeah. right, again, that's a really yeah. Yeah. difficult question, um, but a really and important even, one. And an interesting fact is that I, I mean, I see even today how this has been going on, cross-border human tra trafficking and people are profiting Mm -hmm. from the ordeal of this of this very very very, very rich, rich, rich human beings right right so no really, and um really shocking. human it's it's a real business i mean we i meet with clients who have been um brought to the united states more in you know human trafficking in in a way um where they're getting we say coyote generally on um our southern border but they're paid to bring someone to the United States versus someone who's coming to the United States actually trafficked for sex or for work. Um, so there's kind of two different ways to look at it, but someone profiting from the movement of people across borders. Um, and we see incredibly nefarious actions by, um, by uh, these coyotes, especially they will go to communities in Central America and say, you know, you gotta come now because the laws are gonna change in a month and if you don't come, you know, and you need to pay me $7,000 to do this. And um, people do it and it's not necessarily true what the information they're providing, but they are fear mongering and encouraging people because it's a profitable business for them. And they will take children. Um, it's, it's pretty terrifying. It shocked me when in the movie they, they were saying that they need $30,000, $40,000 just to move mm -hmm. uh, from Russia to Sweden. 
Um, Ruth asked, um, has the attention towards EM emergencies in Afghanistan and U Ukraine and providing immediate aid to those refugees influenced the length of time that other refugees and or asylum seekers in the US have to wait? That is a really good question. And I don't know the answer to that right now. I think we will see over the next year. I mean, the bottom line is right now, so the Afghans that we'll be working with, they will be going through what's called an affirmative asylum process. So they're not actually in like this deportation proceeding. So it's more administrative, it's an interview, um, but they could end up in deportation proceedings. But they're supposed to go through this process, um, basically would be done with the application process within six months of applying. But I've had clients um, in the affirmative asylum process who've been waiting for three, four or five years. So there is a, you know, someone say they're, they're getting in line, they're gonna get benefits prior to people who've been waiting longer. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a very imperfect system with a lot of flaws and people who um, are eligible for these benefits have been, many of them have been waiting way too right. long. Right. We have a few comments from our colleagues. Stacy wrote, I work at a high school in Green Bay and we have new students who are from Afghanistan. We are doing what we can to provide EL services and help help them feel welcome. Thank you, Stacy. It's really um, it's really nice to hear that. Kedethi uh, wrote, thank you so much for this information presentation and for being a strong advocate for immigration and refugees. Without saying, I mean, it's really a tremendous job, job that Erin, you are doing. And the Darshana said, um, Thanks, Erin. I was wondering if there is any focus on the part of Immigrant Justice Clinic to support media made media made by the refugees about their experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, as we saw from Flea, it's important to provide a space for refugees to narrate their own stories. No, I think that's such a good point. And I am generally very nervous with my clients speaking to the media. And I think as we, you know, this movie, he told his story under a pseudonym because it, 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 there's danger to him by telling the, tr the truth of his story, even though there was reasons and there's no blame or mistake in what he did. It's, there's a reason why he's protecting his identity because he's scared of the repercussions that he may lose his status possibly or, for um, the misinformation that he may have provided. But once people, um, there are a lot of people doing, um, doing this work uh, that are sharing their stories, especially after they have completed the process. Um, I do have clients who tell their stories before that and that is their, um, their right. And it's incredibly powerful because I have the honor of people sharing their stories with me, um, but they're not my stories to be told. And I think the power, of people having the freedom to tell their stories, the power, it would be powerful to make true change in, um, in our lack of humanitarian protection for people around the world. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. Um, we have one more comments. Uh, Sahil um, Sasidharan, uh, uh, he commented about that. You mentioned about diversity lottery. Flea made it, evident that a combination of luck and privilege were cru crucial for Amin's successful immigration. And if even the waiting itself re re requires a lot of support, whether as a visitor, refugee, or asylum. Clearly, it seems that this is similar to a lottery, uh, which is not open to all. And any support through this process would be crucial. Yeah, he th thank you and stay tasty. Uh, Susan Walker. Um, the, thank you for presenting this in, important information. I am a Wisconsin law, lawyer who had the chance to work in Kababul for a few years, and I'm grateful to learn more about the work in pro progress and how I may might assist. Um, so these are the co comments. Um, if you if you'd like anything to add. Uh, or else I'll, I would like to ask you one more question and then most probably we'll be up for the day. I 
I think the only thing I would say, yeah, the diversity lottery, all of this, it's incredibly complicated and convoluted and someone attempting to navigate this, um, even, you know, if you have a legal background, it's incredibly difficult. The only reason I know how to do a lot of these things is because I've been doing it for a long time. Um, but I wish that one day everybody has access to an attorney to, I, I wish that nobody needs an asylum mm -hmm. attorney because nobody will need asylum, but that's not going to happen. Um, and until that day comes, I believe that everyone deserves representation and should never be standing alone fighting for their life in a country like the United States. And once um, everyone has attorney to do that, they will have a better likelihood of being able to remain in a place where they're safe. Yeah, right. Mitra is ask, asking, what do you recommend uh, we do to help evacuees in Dane County? if you have any advice. Yeah, I mean, any of the Jewish Social Services is doing a lot of good work. Also, the Immigration Affairs Office of, um, of Dane County, that is in um, Parisi's office, they provide direct representation to people, especially in emergent situations. So if a child is sick or, um, you know, they lose their home or something like that. So there's a lot of good work being done in Dane County. We have a lot of support, and I think um, we're on the way to ensuring that our new neighbors feel welcome, even after they had to forcibly leave their their homes. Right. Um, we and also have... open doors for refugees. They do really great work as well. And I'm sure I'm forgetting others, but um, feel free to email me, and I'll provide more. So we have five more minutes to go. Um, it's almost five. We have spent an exciting one hour with Erin. Um, she walks us to, through the pro process of the USS asylum pro process and the laws and policies and practice, practices. Uh, before uh, we close, do you have any final th thoughts to share with our viewers, Erin? Uh, I just want to thank everyone for being here and for welcoming me welcoming me into this space to share about some of the work that I do. I think people often ask, you know, what can I do to help or what can I do to support this effort? And I think all of you that are here are doing just that by learning about um, the truth of what's going on and some of the issues. And the more we're informed, the more we know the truth, the more um, we can hopefully uh, make positive changes for um, our new neighbors and for people around the world. Uh, once again, I would like to thank you very much, Adrian, for your time to today. Um, uh, uh, what is unfolding in Ukraine now is totally heartbreaking. As we speak, nearly 3.5 million people have al al already crossed the Ukrainian border. There are more than 25 million refugees in the world today, which doesn't even account for another 50 million internally displaced what is happening in Afghanistan, Myanmar, Syria, Ethiopia, just to name a few is heart, heartening, as if to, to me things are falling apart. We share our deepest thoughts with every victims of all con conflicts. The, this is a grim reminder of our continued struggle for a conflict-free, peaceful world and to fight injustices everywhere. With this note, I would like to thank our viewers and we would invite you to, to the next IREC event. Please stay tuned and check your e emails for any announcement. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.